Great, and uh, so delighted to be with these uh, wonderful, as we always say, these rectangles of love. And of course, <laughs> I'm modifying a wonderful utterance of Rumi who uttered, please come out of the circle of time and enter the circle of love. So these are, these are the rectangles of love. So today I'm going to uh, touch upon Rumi and the Quran and Islam. You might, uh, I'm sure you all, most of you know, all of you know the 13th century poet and sage Rumi. Not everybody knows that Rumi was also a very well-known, phenomenal theologian and scholar. One of his utterances, uh, I'm a slave of the Quran. I am dust on the path of Muhammad. It is said that the bulk of his poetry, and Rumi wrote very little. He was going to a trance and just utter, and his friends and family uh, would write down his utterances. And the collection of that is Rumi poetry. And the bulk of Rumi poetry is about the inner teachings of the Quran, because Rumi had dealt very deep into the Quran. Mainly because, he would say, he had done his spiritual practices of transforming his ego and opening up his heart. He was freed from what he called scholarly vertigo or exhausted famousness of the scholars and theologians. And he was very wary of theologians who would politicize the religion. In fact, he had a phrase, he would say, from these theologians, it's all fireworks and no light, all husk and no kernel. So, essentially, Rumi's utterances are very profound, deep, meaningful, because it is said he moved from a knowledge of the tongue to a knowledge of the heart. And when you do that, and this is one of Rumi's pleas to us, you know, he's, he, he begs us, please open your heart, open your heart, because if you open your heart, amazing things happen. He says, look what happened to me, meaning Rumi, I was in my head totally, totally in my head. But when my heart opened up, uh, one of his phrases is, I began to hear bird song in the egg. I began to hear bird song in the egg. And he would say, this is in your power. This is really in your power. He says, if you don't believe me, he asks us to think about this. How do birds know how to make nests? Spiders make a web. Beavers make a dam. Bees collect nectar. Did they go to graduate school? How did they get this knowledge? It's a gift from divinity. And this can happen to me and to you. So let me... Uh, just tell you some things he said about the Quran. There's a verse in the Quran. I'm just reading it for so, so, so that I read it exactly as it is in the Quran. The, the verse in the Quran says, this book of blessings we have sent down to you is so that you may meditate on its signs and people of insight might take them to heart. Every holy book has difficult verses. They're called particular verses in these historical textual context. But every holy book has incredibly wise, beautiful, universal verses beyond space and time. But Rumi's point here is that our understanding of any verse in any holy book is a reflection of our state of consciousness. He gives a metaphor, a bee and a wasp they drink from the same flower, a bee and a wasp. They drink from the same flower. One produces nectar, other one produces a sting. So something for us to reflect on. What is my state of consciousness as I approach any holy book? 
Another verse in the Quran says, the human being tends to be very argumentative. The human being is contentious. So Rumi advises us, don't get so involved in all these debates, unnecessary debates about doctrine, dogma, belief. He says, doing that, I, I, you know, I love metaphors. His metaphor is, when you get involved in unnecessary discussion about dogma and doctrine, he says, we like a bird that ties a snare around its leg, a knot around its leg, and then unties it. Then makes the, the knot and the snare even more complicated, more complex, complex, and unties it. And does it again even more complex to show off its strange skill, forgetting the point is to escape. Or oh, the beauty of the freedom you feel soaring in the blue sky, smelling the freshness of the meadows. There's one more point that comes to my mind. Uh, Rumi would say, if somebody criticizes your holy book or your religion, and you get so upset, know that it's not your holy book that has been bruised, it is your ego that has been bruised. Again, another metaphor. Jamal, if you believe your Quran is so beautiful, so spacious, so amazing, like the spaciousness and beauty of the blue sky, if somebody spits, if somebody spits at the sky, your holy book, does that pollute the sky? In fact, says Rumi, the spit comes back to you. So, so don't overreact, says Rumi. Okay, just be with that for a few moments. I've got copious notes here, and I'm keeping a track of time. Uh, as people know, those who know me, I fall in the category of the Taoists, uh, the Taoism, you know, where they say the biggest problem human beings have, they just don't know when to stop. So I have the clock, I have those notes, I will stop at the right time. So now let me put uh, this into context, Rumi, Quran, Islam, let me take some verses from what, what is called the template of Islam. If you study Buddhism, for example, Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path. In Islam, we have three principles and five pillars. So what's the first principle of Islam? The first principle of Islam is Islam itself. And what does Islam mean? Islam means to surrender in peace. And the Quran suggests or asks even, what are you surrendering? You're surrendering, says the Quran, your attachment to your ego so that you can bring, I'm quoting the Quran again, a heart turned in devotion to God. And there's a verse in the Quran that says, say, and I'm quoting the Quran, say my life, my living, my prayers, my sacrifice, my death are all for you my sustainer, my cherisher. Now the mystics say, Rumi says, we'll never understand this until we become a seeker. Because I'm immersed in the hypnotic trance of living a very mundane life, struggling to survive or to thrive. I'm not yet a seeker. The Quran says, you will not appreciate Islam until you become a seeker. And Rumi says that, among other things, the two veils that stand in the way of me become a seeker, the veils of health and wealth. When my health is good, or there is wealth, not just money, also emotional security, all this talk about surrendering your ego, opening up your heart, being a service to God's creation, is not only irrelevant, it's very, very inconvenient until, because we are unmindful, it can happen in other ways, but mostly because we are unmindful, it can happen when we face a crisis of health or wealth, death of a loved one. 
drastic change in circumstances. Then suddenly, I wake up. Like the Buddha says, there's an awakening. And I, asked, I begin to ask deeper questions. Who am I? What am I doing here? Where did I come from? Where am I going when I die? But most of all, I need help. But I need help from a source greater than human personality. That's when that verse, Rumi says, splashes in your chest. Say, my life, my living, my prayers, my sacrifice are all for you, my cherisher, my sustainer. And that's when you begin what the Quran says, a divine exchange. My life becomes a divine exchange. Allowing more and more divine attributes, love, compassion, forgiveness, generosity, to enter into the center of my life and me letting go more and more of my ego traits, my pride, my greed, my jealousy, my excessive anger, my meanness. It's a constant daily struggle. The divine exchange. The Quran says, Allah is the best of providers. Ah, Rumi goes into a trance and he comes up with these utterance. Jamal, where will you find a customer like God who pays in gold? Who accepts your counterfeit coins? Buys your dirty, shabby bag of goods? And gives you a spiritual spring? whose waters are so delicious. Where will you find a customer like God who pays in gold? So we have to ask ourselves, where can, where can we find, as Rumi says, a market like this for one weak breath, the divine breath, for one little seed, the rose garden, Rumi says, for God's sake, for God's sake, sell and buy at once. So just be with that. Am I engaging in that cosmic divine exchange? Okay. The second principle of Islam is Iman or faith, having faith. Let's say faith in God. Uh, I love the words of the mystics, Rumi included, who says, to have authentic faith, move from borrowed certainty, move from borrowed certainty to an inner knowing. Borrowed certainty to an inner knowing. And the Quran says there are three stages of faith. The first one is hearsay. Ilmul yaqeen. Second one is exploration. Ainul yaqeen. Ain means eyes, witnessing, exploring, learning from life experiences. The third one is haq al yaqeen. The truth emerging from within. The imagery used by mystics, including Rumi, is the flame of a beautiful candle and the moth. And the moth is told, there is this beautiful flame. That's hearsay. Ah, then the moth begins to explore and sees the flame. That's the second stage. Then the moth comes close to the flame, maybe even goes into the flame, but feels the warmth, feels the Glow of presence, that's real faith. That, that faith which emerges from within me. Haq al yaqeen says the Quran. Incidentally, I, you know, it, it, as I'm talking, I'm reminded of this wonderful poet Tagore uh, from Bengal. I'm a Bengali, uh, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, who says, Faith is the bird that sings in the dark, knowing that dawn is coming. And we need faith. And why do we need faith? Because without faith, there is very little hope. A verse from the Quran. 
It is God who sends down the rain. It is God who sends down the rain when humankind has lost all hope and unfolds his grace. Metaphorically, the Quran says, the earth was parched. The earth was parched, but the waters of mercy came down and the earth became clothed in green. Rumi. Rumi says, exclaims, dear heart, never lose hope. Never lose hope. Dear heart, never lose hope. Even if the whole world turns against you, keep your eyes on that friend. Be conscious of God. Be conscious of God. And the Quran says, if you have that faith, be hopeful. Particularly in times of affliction, difficulties, troubles. But the Quran says, do two things according to your capacity in your times of affliction. Please continue with your spiritual practices and please continue being of service to God's creation. Rumi says, yes, please, according to your capacity, be in attendance at the divine court. Be in attendance at the divine court. And according to your capacity, be of service. Be a lamp, a lifeboat, or a ladder to others. That's when you'll find that the Quran says, God will provide for you in ways you cannot even imagine. And Rumi exclaims, you can imagine. He says, in times of affliction, a stretcher comes from grace to help you. And even if you don't get what you want, for whatever reason, the Quran suggests you will feel an inner peace, a calmness, a sakina, a deep inner peace. Again, just be with that for a few moments. What is my faith based on? Do I have hope in my life? Okay, the third principle of Islam is ihsan, meaning make yourself beautiful. How? Ah, by transforming your ego from a commanding master into a personal assistant and, and the tradition goes on, by purifying and opening your heart. A verse in the Quran says, God will not change the condition of a people unless they change what is in their hearts. So we've got to do the inner inconvenient work to become a more complete, developed, evolved human being. Now I'm just reminded of a, my, one of my favorite verses from Mirza Ghalib who's a 19th century Sufi poet from South Asia, who says, Jamal, your face was dirty. Jamal, your face was unclean. But you were obsessed with just cleaning and polishing, cleaning and polishing the mirror. You've got to do the real inconvenient work. Ah. Rumi says there's a misunderstanding about this phrase, annihilation of the ego. It's about transforming the ego. What does it mean to annihilate the ego? It does not mean you destroy it. You can never destroy the ego. So he gives a metaphor. He says, let's say the ego is like the flame of a candle. In those days, no electricity. You need the flame of the candle to find your way in the dark. But once you come into the land of the radiant sun, I'm enlightened now, or I'm close to enlightenment, or becoming highly evolved. Once, as I come into the land of the radiant sun, the radiance of the sun subsumes the flame of the candle. But the flame of the candle still exists. Take a cloth, put it next to the flame of the candle, it burns but it is subsumed. In that sense, it is annihilated.
So I love Rumi's metaphor. He said, this is the work you have to do. Mar marry your soul. That wedding is the way. Marry your soul. That wedding is the way. Every day, I mean, every hour, every day, every week, every month, make every effort to align your personality to come closer and closer towards the soul. The Prophet Muhammad said, every day in the course of the day, daily, I'm either ennobling, enriching my soul, or I'm diminishing my soul by the choices I'm making. Okay, I'm looking at the time. I better speak fast or cut, <laughs> remove some material here. Uh, so that's about transforming the ego from a commanding master into a personal assistant. The other work as a part of the inner inconvenient work is to purify the heart and to open the heart. The, the Quran has a verse. It says, Jamal, when you have negative evil thoughts, you engage in evil negative actions, you create a rust, R-U-S-T, on your heart. You create a veneer of rust on your heart. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, for every polish there is a rust. For every polish there is a rust. And the polish for the rust of the heart is remembrance of God. Can I use God's solvents? Patience, love, compassion, generosity to polish my heart. Polish it, polish it, polish it. So it becomes like a polished mirror. As I take it to God, it reflects the face of Allah on the mirror. Ah, Rumi breaks into a, into a trance and he comes up with this poetry. Jamal, if you get irritated by every rub 